Okay, welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, to those of you who are in person, thank you for being here in person and those on the Zoom webinar as well. I'm Jeff Miller. I'm one of the co-directors of Grand Rounds, um, and, along with Drs. Kate Elkington and Christine Denny. Christine is going to be moderating the Zoom webinar portion when we get to the Q&A today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. Uh, next week's Grand Rounds will be given by Tarjinder TJ Singh, Assistant Professor in Computational and Statistical Genomics here at Columbia University. The title of, title of his talk is Insights into the Genetic Architecture of Psychiatric Disorders Through Population Scale Sequencing. And like today, next week's talk will be an in-person grand round. So we welcome you all to return in person to the auditorium and to stay with us after both this week's talk and next week's talk for a lunch outside the auditorium at 1220. Um, so before I hand things over to the OEDI leadership team to introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping things. Um, for those of you who are joining us via Zoom webinar, we encourage you to ask questions and to post questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A feature, not the chat, but the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. We like to prioritize trainee questions. And so if you're a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question. We also encourage people on the Zoom webinar to ask questions themselves. And we're able to do that by promoting you temporarily to panelists. So at the beginning of your question in the Q&A section, please write, can ask question myself or prefer to have question read. Um, okay, and so without further ado, I'd like to hand things over at this time to Dr. Marissa Spann, Director of the Office of Equity, Diversity, Diversity and Inclusion, to introduce today's talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm very excited for today's presentation, um, specifically in honor of Black History Month. Um, one of the things that um, our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion is introducing today is we want to really highlight our um, junior faculty and trainees, um, giving them the opportunity and you all the opportunity to get to know them. So I'm going to call up actually one of our junior faculty, Venus Mahmoudi, to actually do the presentation of the speaker. And this is something that you'll continue to see from us as we do ongoing grand rounds. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm so excited to um, introduce our speaker, Dr. Ijoma Opara. Uh, Dr. Ijoma Opara is an assistant professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Yale School of Public Health, the director of the Substances and Sexual Health SASH Lab, and the associate director of the Justice, Community Capacity, and Equity Core Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS. Dr. Dr. Opara defines herself as a community-based participatory researcher with experience in working with youth and community organizations dedicated to reducing youth substance use and improving mental health outcomes for youth in urban communities. Dr. Dr. Opara's research focuses on strength-based approaches for urban youth for urban um, for urban youth substance use and HIV prevention. Her second line of research involves highlighting racial and gender specific strategies in prevention research for black girls. Dr. Opara is also involved in other studies that focus on using multiple sources of data and methodologies to inform and develop strength-based substance use prevention interventions that involve community support, promote racial, ethnic identity and pride, and strengthen social support and youth empowerment for Black and Hispanic youth and their families. Dr. Opara is also an award-winning scientist and has received awards not only for her research, but her dedication to mentoring the next generation of public health practitioners. In addition, she has also received awards from the city of Patterson, New Jersey, due to her role as a community-based participatory researcher in youth substance use prevention. Um, and Dr. Opara previously worked as a youth and family therapist in New York and New Jersey, where she worked primarily with girls of color and their families. Dr. Opara, we would love for you to join us. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you all for having me. You make me feel so special, like I'm a celebrity or something. <laughs> the bio was wonderful. Okay, I don't see my PowerPoint. Okay, okay, no problem. So thank you all for having me today. I love talking about my work on um, Black girls. Um, so I'm super excited to not only share the work that I'm doing within my lab, but then also to, to hear from you about some of the work, some of you who may be working um, in this area or are interested in working in this area too. I love to learn from the audience as well. So before I go into talking about my research, which is focusing on um, strength-based approaches to um, substance use with Black girls, I want to first start off with um, talking a little bit about my, my experience as a youth and family therapist and to introduce you to one of my former clients, clients, Sheila. So I'm familiar with New York. While I live in Connecticut, a majority of my clinical experience has been in New York. Um, I went to school in New York. I went to NYU, did um, worked as a youth and family therapist in New York City, um, and I worked um, for an alternative to incarceration agency before going to um, academia. So my time at the alternative to incarceration agency, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's an agency that works with youth who are involved in the criminal justice system and provides them an alternative to incarceration. Um, typically, in order for you to be a part of the program, you have to be appointed by a family court judge to qualify to be a part of this program. And what we did was we provided um, family therapy for about six months, six to eight months, with um, selected youth and their families to see whether they could engage in understanding some of the underlying issues that may have caused them to be involved in the criminal justice system. And if they do well with us, then we write a letter to the court, to the judge. We 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 um, present their case, and then hopefully either charges get dropped or they get a much lower sentence or get put on probation. Um, so Sheila was actually one of my first clients, who's actually my first client. And with this agency, what we did was we did, that. what made it unique was that we did, we conducted therapy in the home. So we represented all um, five boroughs. Typically as a therapist, you get assigned to one borough, but because I had a car, they assigned me to all the boroughs. I know it was a lot. So I know, I know New York City so well because, because, because of this work. So my first um, day on the job, they introduced me to Sheila and they, and all I, all I knew about Sheila was, was on her um, information sheet. On the sheet, it talked about how she was arrested for like gang involvement, um, burglary, kidnapping. It was scary. I was like, you want me? You want that to be my first case? Like, like, like I was terrified. So I, I said, okay, fine. Let me just push through, do it. She's a young black teenage girl, about 16 years old. And I went to her house. And as soon as I walked in the door, I noticed that she was on the couch crying. And I was like, what happened? She was like, um, I, you know, I slit my, my finger with a, like a, she got a paper cut and she was crying over that. And then her grandmother was like yelling at her to stop crying and stuff. But it was at that moment that I realized, wow, she's really a kid, you know? And it just made me think about how we view children, especially black children through this really like criminal adultified lens without acknowledging their experiences as kids, right? This was someone that was in a gang, but was crying about having a paper cut, you know? So it just kind of just showed me um, the innocence of her um, and kind of informed the work that I did with her um, as her therapist. So to tell you the story about Sheila, um, one of the first activities that we did um, together, just for me to get to kind of get to know her, um, was I asked her to draw a picture of herself. I wanted to kind of see, how she thought of herself in relationships to the world. How did the world view her as just a young teenage girl? And it was an activity that I did with all of my clients. Cause those of you who may work with teenagers, you know, they don't really want to talk to you <laughs> until you like, they get to know you. So it was a great activity, a great icebreaker for us to, to do. So I said, just draw a picture of yourself. Let me know what you think the world, how the world sees you. I told her to then describe the picture to me. And as she started to describing the picture, she started crying. I told her, tell me some of the words that you think um, people are viewing, you know, how, they're, how they view you and what this picture represents, right? When looking at the picture, the, per the, the young girl in this picture looked obviously angry. She was frowning, right? And she told me then the, that, she, that people often say that she's an angry, you know, little black girl. She's aggressive. Um, she said that often she would hear that she was easy. She was intimidating. She was scary. Like she, you know, talked about how much how much adults in her environment, in her school, were scared of her. And oftentimes she talked about how they over-sexualized her, how they would call her a slut 
and a whore. And this was a young 15 year old, 16 year old girl who was aware of these experiences and aware of what she felt adults in her life and her immediate life viewed her. I then noticed as we got to know each other that she was using drugs, right? And using drugs and alcohol. And this was mainly as a way to cope with this identity crisis that she was facing with trying to figure out how can she relate to her peers and how she is presenting to adults in her life. She was really stressed, you know, because, because of this, because of these expectations that were put on her. And she wanted to like do things like the young girls her age were doing, like having a boyfriend, having sex, doing all these things as a way to connect with her peers. Um, she was looking for that connection that she wasn't getting from her house. She um, had, you know, really um, difficult relationships, you know, growing up. She wasn't in touch with her mother. So these were all things that she was dealing with and nobody ever like stopped to ask, like, you know, how are you coping? How is this, you know, affecting you and your development? And she, you know, she didn't even know the words to describe what she was actually feeling. So this example is, a, is an example of gender racism and how this could have a direct impact on black girls as they cope with this like subtle yet common stressor, right? So for those of you who may not be familiar with the term gendered racism, it's a specific kind of stressor that's unique to black girls, right? And it's different than the racism that black boys and men face. And it's also different than the sexism that white girls and women face. And it's mainly due to our intersecting identities, including this, you know, race, gender, class, and then age is an identity that I focus on in my work because age for black girls and for most, you know, for all adolescents limits their mobility, but also affects how they're viewed, how they're treated and who, and, and whether their voices actually matter in these, in these situations. They're often reliant on adults to be able to provide them with a sense of protection um, and then, and black girls living in these urban under-resourced communities oftentimes are not viewed as children, which then can impact um, their mobility and how they're able to navigate through the world. I talk about gendered racism in my work with black girls because these are internalized messages, perceptions, and stereotypes that can end up leading to unhealthy coping mechanisms, such as using drugs and alcohol, and even engaging in sexual um, unhealthy behaviors or risk behaviors, which girls may feel like they're expected to engage in because they're over-sexualized and they're dying or trying to get this sense of connection. But what's interesting though about black girls and, and substance use is that there's this gender paradox where girls in general often have um, lower rates than boys, including black girls compared to black um, girls from other ethnic uh, minority groups, black girls actually have some, some of the, some lower rates or historically lower rates of drug use than other girls. But what we're seeing is that even though they may have lower rates, they have the worst health outcomes associated with drug use, such as fertility issues, engagement in sexual behavior, behaviors that will lead to, or can lead to STIs, um, HIV, so and so forth, early pregnancy as well too. And these are all things that can limit their mobility and, and affect their transition, their healthy transition to adulthood. And what we're seeing with the data, with national data is that the rates of drug use are slowly rising for girls across the board, but especially black girls too. So it's essential for us to be able to think about alternative paths to drug use prevention um, as the rates of drug use are continuing to rise for girls of color, especially um, you know, black girls. And given that there are these racial and gender disparities that are plaguing black girls, we can't talk about substance use prevention without acknowledging the role of racism and sexism, but more specifically, teaching them how to challenge racism and sexism that's present within the everyday values within our society that girls are growing up in. So when I, st I always start off my talks explaining the, the story of Sheila, because girls like Sheila, you know, young black girls like Sheila are the foundation of the work that I'm doing, um, trying to highlight their strengths, but also trying to um, work with them to, to, to think about more innovative ways to focus on prevention of substance use amongst this population. They're the reason why I just genuinely do this work. So as I, as our, um, as I mentioned, I'm also the director of the Substances and Sexual Health Lab, which is a lab um, that focuses mainly on strength-based approaches to substance use and also HIV, STI prevention, and overall sexual health amongst youth. Um, 
and I engage in two areas of research um, within, our, within our work. The first area, which we'll hear about today, is the strength-based strategies for substance use prevention amongst Black girls, too. And then my second area uses community-based participatory research methods in youth substance use and HIV prevention across genders. Um, I do a majority if not all my work with CBPR um, in Patterson, New Jersey, which is not too far from here. I think it's about 30 minutes you know, from here. Um, and um, I am now expanding, expanding to another um, community called East Orange, New Jersey, another predominantly black um, community as well too. Um, but for the purposes of this talk and for time, I will only talk about my work um, with black girls and substance use, but I'm more than happy to talk about um, my work with, um, in New Jersey and CBPR and how I engage in it in the Q&A as well too. Also feel free to look up my lab website that has a list of all my publications around um, HIV. Um, my publication um, web webpage is um, organized through research areas if you're interested in reading up on my, on my work. And shameless plug, we have our lab report. <laughs> we have a lab report, I try to publish a lab report every year, um, mainly to show the world, not just our research successes, but also some of the work that we're doing with outreach and being able to provide, um, you know, show our impact that we're having, not only in communities, but just really nationally. So feel free to, that is up on um, our page. So feel free to go to our website to check it out. You can also email the SASH lab if you wanna be on our listserv as well too, when we, when we publish our next um, lab report, which will probably be in the summertime or in fall. I also want to point out that throughout this presentation, as I talk about my work, I will use the term Black to represent girls with Afro ancestry, but I do acknowledge that Black girls are not a homogeneous group, and black, but Black girls in the U.S. do share some similar experiences related to racism and sexism and how they're viewed in society as a whole. Um, so even though they can have vastly different sociocultural histories um, based on their ethnicity, where they grew up, um, their you know, class level, um, this could all contribute to how they're treated and viewed in the world. Um, but so I do want to be clear, just as I talk about this work with Black girls, that's not my intention to present Black girls as this monolithic group during my talk. All right. So throughout my research, when looking at um, the literature on substance use prevention in Black girls, I realized there were some significant gaps in substance use prevention literature and understanding why Black girls who may live in urban neighborhoods. Um, and for those of us who kind of know the substance use literature, you know that there's these major risk factors that are often talked about, right? Living in a dangerous environment, living in an under-resourced environment, being exposed to substances, trauma, um, you know, having a parent that uses substance in general. These are all risk factors that we shouldn't take lightly that most likely will predict substance use amongst youth. But then I wondered, what about the girls that are exposed to this that aren't using drugs? that aren't engaging in like sexually um, you know, risky behaviors. I was one of them. You know, I grew up in an urban environment in Jersey City, um, New Jersey, not the Jersey City you know today, but the, the Jersey City of like, you know, 30 something years ago. But um, I grew up in that environment and, you know, and I wasn't engaging in substance use. And I felt like in the literature, they didn't talk about the stories of girls like me and figuring out what was it about me? You know, and um, what made me, someone like me, not engage in those behaviors and other girls that, are, that were like me and how can we learn from them? Um, so as a way to learn from them, my research focuses specifically on what factors are present in the lives of black girls that are not using drugs and what makes them resilient in an attempt that we can duplicate those measures um, for other girls as a prevention strategy. So the four factors that I focus on in my work are ethnic identities, role in prevention, um, sense of community. So thinking about how connected um, girls may feel in their neighborhoods, um, families role in prevention, and also empowerment's role in prevention. Um, and just to share some definitions, ethnic identity, for those of you who may not be aware of it, it also can be interchanged with um, racial identity as well too. Um, refers to an individual's pride, commitment, and attachment to their ethnicity and cultural group. Why this is significant is that Black children from birth are taught that they're an inferior group. They're taught that their race, you know, is inferior and that they're just not enough, right? So it's important when we look at ethnic identity to see how much of that do they believe 
And are they in areas where they can counter that feeling and be pri prideful and feel good about who they are as Black children and be surrounded by people, not only that look like them, but people that are engaging in like successful, you know, initiatives that are, um, that are engaged, that are that that look like them, that could be that can serve as a role model, but also an example, um, as well. Sense of community focuses on how connected one feels to their community or neighborhood. Um, in my work with um, with young kids in urban communities, oftentimes there's this there's this difficulty in feeling connected to your neighborhood because you were told repeatedly that in order for you to succeed, you have to leave your neighborhood. I believe your community, your community is hopeless. And, and what that ends up turning is this feeling of hopelessness within their community and this hatred for their community. But in my work, I encourage, I encourage this sense of community because the community is who you are, you know, especially for a lot of the girls that I work with, they were born in this community. So imagine what that does to your self-esteem if you're ashamed of your community and you are taught you know, through prevention programs, through schools, that the only way you'll make it is to leave your community. So, and what if you just, what if you can't? What if that's just something that is not even accessible to you, right? So that's a area that I focus on in my work. Um, social support. So social support measures, um, it measures how well um, does a child feel like they have, you know, peers, family, um, teachers that would help them in a difficult situation or feel this level of connection and support, you know, for them. And then lastly is empowerment. So empowerment is how well does one feel they have control over their um, environment. Now, because I'm working on establishing myself as this expert on strength-based um, work with black girls, you know, I don't just do this just for my career because you know it's required for my job, like you know, to publish all this work. I do this because I it's important for me to show other researchers the value of incorporating strengths and then also introducing them to measures um, that we can incorporate in prevention programs, incorporate in our survey and data collection and our work um, and highlight the importance of protective factors or strengths within these communities as a prevention strategy, specifically for black girls um, you know, as well too. It's, it's important for me, and this is the snapshot of my, my articles. Um, I have I have more that focus on black girls, but this was just, just I just wanted to post, post this because these are just some of the the articles that I've actually used some of these protective factors that I'm talking about and I've tested them out, you know, in this in this work. In my work, I have two major theories that I use with with, with my with black girls. I use overall as you know as my foundation in my work. The first is intersectionality theory, which is very is becoming controversial now, but I'm happy that I'm in New York and not Florida. <laughs> you know? So hopefully everybody has heard of this theory or at least <laughs> or at least is or at least is comfortable with me talking about it. But intersectionality theory explains that due to their race, their gender, their socioeconomic status, and then their age, this is also this is all gonna impact how where girls live. Um, it's going to impact what they're exposed to. It's going to impact the type of messages that they receive regarding who they are in relationship to the world. Now, with intersectionality theory, it poses that Black girls will experience a level of, of adversity due to racism and the other isms. And this is even regardless of socioeconomic status. I want to just add that. Um, and they must develop these attitudes and behaviors that will prevent them from internalizing these experiences. Now, when we look at drug use um, prevention um, research, um, very few studies have actually heard from the voices of Black girls and figuring out what makes them resilient, um, what makes them not use drugs. We don't understand enough in the field about why they're not using drugs and what factors in their life make them resilient despite being exposed to daily racist, sexist, and demeaning messages. Um, so this area of research is essential because it aids in the way that we change, it aids in the way of changing this perception of Black girls um, overall. So because of this, because I'm really interested in changing the narrative, it was important for me to engage in two types of um, methodology. So the first, I focus a lot on qualitative research, um, really being able to ask deep questions um, with, our, with our youth and being able to use their voices and understand the intricacies of what is it about them, their families, their background, or how they see fit as to why they're making a decision not to use drugs. And one of the studies that I, I conducted a few years ago, um, it was funded by SAMHSA. Um, and this study was actually conducted in Patterson, New Jersey um, with a sample of about 69 girls. Um, and there was a quote from a young black girl that struck me and I wanna share it. Um, it involved her dad 
and this decision that she made not to use drugs. My dad would tell me, you are a black woman. People out there expect you to fail just because you're black. You don't need to use drugs just because everybody else is doing it. I want you to finish school and go to college, make a good name for yourself and prove the haters wrong. You know I'm here for you always. Now, why I highlight this quote is because of course it's obvious, right? That parents who talk to their kids about drugs are more likely to have children not use drugs. But to give you all context, when I think about this, talk about the city of Patterson, the, the girls in the study were, you know, believe there was this added pressure um, for their parents to intentionally talk about drug use based on the multiple drug epidemics that were visible in their town. Um, and also as a way to challenge negative racist and gendered stereotypes that were often placed on black girls in that community. Um, so through this lens of highlighting strengths of black girls and their families, I wanna emphasize the unique role and this added pressure that parents in urban communities and, under, and, and also other under-resourced communities have in which they can't just tell their kids just don't use drugs. Oh, here are all the negative effects of drugs, just don't use it. They can't just say that, right? Because there's this, um, because they're also working on challenging these negative racial gender stereotypes of their daughters while also living in environments that are designed not to support them. These are environments that lack resources. These are environments that often pro promote the ideology and the normalization of youth substance use based on community levels of trauma and based on um, residential or, or racial segregation that has made these communities lack these resources and foster this, this, um, this sense of hopelessness within the community. So one of my goals as a researcher has been to make these major contributions to the field of empowerment in Black girls um, and their families as well. So building off of the qualitative study that I just talked about, um, I wanted to further explain um, or explore the role of adult allies um, and parental support, especially identity in Black girls, and this whole concept of what it means to be empowered and resilient and how that in itself can be used in drug use prevention. So empowerment theory, um, for example, is a useful theory that builds off of um, just not just resilient youth, but resilient communities too. Um, and just to give you some a definition of empowerment theory, empowerment theory was actually a, it's actually a public health theory, but it's used a lot in psychology. So some of you in here who may do community psychology work, you probably know empowerment theory really well. Um, but empowerment theory is defined as an individual's ability to be able to make systemic social change that can improve their environments and outcomes. Um, how it's measured is through the psychological empowerment um, construct, which is described as this individual level of analysis for empowerment. One of the components um, that I use in my work is interpersonal empowerment, which is focused on how well does one have power or control over their immediate environment. It's also called social political control. Um, and it's measured using the social political control scale. And they also have a subscale specifically for youth. Um, the social, the social political control scale, excuse me, comprises of about two um, dimensions, which are leadership competency, which measures how well does a youth, does a youth, for example, feel that they have, they are a leader in their groups, um, that people will actually listen to them. And then also policy control, which is defined as whether this, this youth feels confident in assessing tools and resources that could actually lead to a change or policy change um, that, could, that impacts them directly. So in one of my studies, I won't talk too much about stats, but I just wanted to share, just share some of these, some of these slides. And one of my studies, in which I used the social political control scale on a sample of black girls, um, I performed latent class analyses to place girls in the study um, in subgroups of social political control to kind of see what is it about social political control and which factor within social political control has a direct impact on not just drug use, but also ethnic identity, social support, and sense of community, all the um, protective factors that I've been um, doing you know, my research in. And just to kind of explain what this graph is showing, it showed that girls that had these high levels of social political control, which is a combination of having a high score and leadership competency and also a high score in policy control actually had lower means of drug use um, compared to girls that had low social political control. So lower, um, um, lower um, scores of leadership competency and lower scores of policy control. Um, but what was interesting was that girls who were in the subgroup of high leadership but then low policy control actually had the lowest means of 30 day drug use, which was interesting to me. So we, this could actually indicate that having this high sense of leadership amongst black girls, especially those living in an urban community can actually be a protective factor that we can implement in drug use prevention. 
Um, I was so interested in this finding and I wanted to further understand the role of empowerment or social political control on black girls and to see if it actually explains the relationship between um, drug, of, of drug use. So I then designed a study using path analysis. And I wanted to test this model to examine drug use as a mediator between um, empowerment, social, social, social support, excuse me, and ethnic identity. And then I found um, that this among a sample of 340 black girls that were part of my study, um, empowerment was a significant predictor to low rates of drug use, which actually had a direct impact too on behavior and sexual, sexually risky behaviors that we, that we measured. So with this work, um, I was able to discover that it is possible for prevention researchers to focus more on preventing drug use, which can actually prevent engaging in like other types of behaviors, like sexual risk behaviors, through simply empowering Black girls. Um, drug education is enough. It's, 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 it's good, right? Like we, we are taught to just teach kids, oh, explain to them what opioids are, explain to them what marijuana is, and just show them how it affects their brain, and then that's enough, right? But you can actually incorporate more levels of empowerment, specifically looking at leadership um, and also policy control and advocacy, while also instilling messages of cultural pride, you know, to being aware that black girls need to hear this, like they need to hear this from people that are coming to talk to them about this work um, and support, fostering this level of support, which can all serve as protective factors when we look at drug use and other outcomes like, you know, um, sexual risk behavior and even mental health as well, which I'll talk about. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the work that I am doing with Black girls overall within the context of our current political climate. You know, so as I talk about the importance of empowerment and civic engagement and advocacy amongst Black girls, I can't help but think about the psychological toll that these past few years have had on Black girls when they see the face of people like Sandra Blonde, for example, or Breonna Taylor or Lauren Smith Field, which I'm sure most of you don't know. She was a young black woman in Connecticut who was killed um, and police kind of disregarded her murder and didn't, didn't investigate why she was killed after even though we were, people were protesting about it in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And they see this, right? They see these tragic stories and this lack of justice for the, for the deaths of black women um, despite massive protests and cries from the public. So I, I tell you today that now is the time for prevention scientists, for clinicians, for researchers to begin developing racial and gender specific programs and spaces for black girls. Mental health issues have increased among black girls. Um, and a recent report came out, I think through the C CDC Youth Risk Behavior Survey that showed that across all, um, you know, across all races for adolescent girls, mental health, mental health issues um, have risen, specifically even suicide ideation has risen amongst adolescent girls. And we're talking about girls as young as like 13 years old, like 13 to 17 years old or so forth. And I will tell you as somebody who did work with black girls, who continues to do research with black girls, when we're seeing trends across race around um, mental health issues, black girls will have worse outcomes, right? And this is because of these lack of cultural competent, competent um, interventions, but also the added layer of racism and sexism and how, they're, how they have to navigate society within that context. I wanna also be clear that these are all risk factors for substance use and, mis and misuse. I try not to use the word abuse because of um, some of the negative connotation with, um, with abuse, but I may use it just out of habit. So just forgive me. For, for that. And also, these are also risk factors for sexual um, risk and unhealthy um, sexual behaviors. Due to the current status of our country, right, there's this major need for us, to, excuse me, there's this major, there's this major need for us um, to create these culturally tailored prevention interventions in order for us to protect black girls. So now is the time for us to develop these sustainable and culturally appropriate um, work so that we can begin to slowly as we, or as we rather rebuild our nation, we can ensure that black girls have this successful transition into adulthood. This brings me to talk about my latest project, the Dreamer Girls Project. Um, this project is one that I'm really passionate about because um, it's so dear to my heart. I love all my projects, but this one, <laughs> but this one, this one I'm really passionate about. Um, and I'm passionate about it because it actually didn't start off as a research project. It actually was conceptualized 13 years ago when my father passed away. I wanted to create something for Black girls that didn't feel like they were supported, that were dealing with losses, that were dealing with mental health issues and, 
you know, needed mentorship and support. But I, I just I just honestly didn't know where to start. Like I thought about creating a nonprofit, but it just seemed like too much work. So I just, you know, just kind of forgot about it. But it was always in my head, the Dreamer Girls Project. Like every year I would just, you know, it would just come up. So fast forward to a few years ago, I had the opportunity as um, a new, a new newly minted PhD to um, apply for a pilot study program um, funded by the National Institutes of Health um, to, to create a program of my choosing that dealt with sexual health and HIV prevention. And I decided to use that work to focus on developing this research project around Black girls, HIV, and drug use, um, and then often and then expand it to something much bigger um, later on. So I used this space to, to create the Dreamer Girls Project. So to give you background about the project, um, you know, this is a project that we're focusing on developing a strength-based HIV and drug use um, intervention using some of the protective factors that I've um, already have tested and done, you know, done research with. Um, but my plan is to, that what we're doing is to have Black girls design the project from beginning to end. Um, you know, by, by what we were doing is we started recruiting um, girls um, through focus groups and then also being able to have girls identify whether they want to be a part of our um, advisory board, which is guiding us on the development of this intervention. Um, so based on my work, um, I will develop this intervention that's going to incorporate the main protective factors, but also understanding using our qualitative findings to see what are some specific things that, we're, that we may be missing that is needed to be a part of this intervention. For, the, for those of you who are intervention um, specialists, you know how long it takes to create an intervention. Oh my gosh, I had all these plans to, <laughs> to create this intervention, but we're in the process, we're still, we're still working on it. So to give you some, some research um, project updates, um, We've, we've finished, um, we've completed qualitative um, focus group on um, data collection. Um, so we collected data from about, 10, from about 10 girls from across the country. It's funny because I initially wanted this project to be focused in New Jersey, but we actually were getting so much attention from girls from other states like Texas, Florida, California that reached out to me saying, I want to be a part of your study. I want to talk about what I want to see in a prevention intervention. And I'm like, really? Oh my so we, so we went back to IRB and opened it up and you know we had while majority of the girls are from New Jersey we do have some representation from other parts of the country um, we assembled a youth advisory board and the and these were girls from across the eight, eight teenage girls from across the country mainly from New Jersey but we did have some other girls from other parts of the country that were able to provide their nuanced experiences um, about drug use, HIV, but also experiences related to um, racism and sexism they were, that they were experiencing in their communities. And then from there, I then expanded the project to then develop um, a, and, and disseminate a survey. Based on the qualitative findings, I decided that I, I wanted to know more about the prevalence of drug use, prevalence of sexual behaviors, but also mental health. Mental health came up a lot across our, um, across our focus groups. So I wanted to kind of understand what are, girl, what are the trends of, um, of anxiety and depression and so forth amongst Black girls? And how, was that, how could that be impacting drug use? Maybe some, and seeing how I could infuse that within my intervention. The next few slides I'm going to show you are just preliminary data from the, from the, from the project. But just to keep in mind that we're still in data collection for our quantitative um, portion of the, of the study. So you guys are getting a sneak peek on <laughs> exclusive access <laughs> on, on this work. <laughs> so first, my research team, we analyzed um, all the transcripts using thematic analysis. And um, this was loosely guided by intersectionality theory, where I just encouraged um, members of my team to be aware of um, place, be aware of socioeconomic status, be aware of these multiple identities that, that Black girls belong to, and how this can impact some of the answers and some of the dialogue that was occurring um, across focus groups. Um, the first theme that popped up, a consistent theme, was the sense of stereotypes, right? These were, these were girls that were about average age, 14, 15 years old, um, and they were very aware of these racial gender stereotypes that were placed on them at such a young age. So um, just to read to you this quote, um, one of the young girls that, were, that was a part of the focus group mentioned, they're always like, oh, black girls probably do this. They do drugs, they drink alcohol and stuff. And I feel like our generation, we're like, oh, people already think that we do this. Why don't we just do it, right? So I wanna make it clear that it becomes this expectation for girls, especially depending on what they see in the media, how we talk about them in our research, how that could actually inform 
policy and these narratives that are placed on black girls, um, it becomes this expectation for girls to engage in these behaviors, either as a way to feel like they belong or as a way to subscribe to what they think they're supposed to do as black teenage girls. Like I mentioned, there were multiple instances of discussion around mental health that kind of generated into a theme where girls were aware of not only the stereotypes, but how it impacted their mental health on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the, the quotes that I'll read to you centered around oppression. Um, you know, these, these girls, I wanna be clear, these are, these are really young girls, right? And they were aware of this language of oppression. They were aware of this language of, of their marginalization and didn't necessarily feel like they had the tools to even do anything about it. So with this quote, and like all that oppression, it keeps on beating us down as black girls. We do face depression, we do face anxiety, and we do face self-esteem issues and self-doubt. And drugs for black girls may be a solution to that. You know, relationships with other people, saying that they get a boyfriend or a partner and that partner makes them feel something that they couldn't feel on their own. Um, so oftentimes this, this need for a romantic relationship at a young age without really knowing what healthy relationships look like, um, it's often not because they're just attracted to all these boys, it mainly is them looking for a connection. And I wanna be clear, it connects back to my work with Sheila. And this is why I love, I, I'm grateful to be in the position where as a clinician, I could go, refer back to my experiences as a clinician working with this population and be able to put that within context in my research you know, world too. So for some of you in here who are clinicians and are thinking about, or you wanna transition to re into research, it's a beautiful thing, especially when you're working with this population because you have an inside scoop or a lens that other researchers may not have. And, you're, and it informs the way you ask questions and informs your topic and the research questions and the type of work that you do to actually impact, you know, impact and inform the field. For our survey, which we're still in data collection about, but just like I said, I'm giving you guys a sneak peek. Um, this, was, this was from a sample of 140 girls. Our target is actually 200. So we're still in the process where we're hoping to finish um, data collection by the end of the semester. Um, but with our quantitative survey, it shows some striking results um, amongst this sample um, pertaining to mental health. Um, so the first we use the GAD to measure anxiety amongst our sample. And um, what we found was that girls in the sample kind of majority, the mean was around nine or scored a nine, which is like about moderate you know, anxiety. For depression, similar, right? So it was about moderate depression as well. And I didn't include this slide, um, but I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you um, verbally and stuff. One of the most starking results for me wasn't even depression and anxiety. I almost expected that because of COVID and all the things that we were seeing in our qualitative findings. Over half of our sample, um, about 58% of the girls in our sample have thought about killing themselves. You know, so, and this is consistent with what we're seeing nationally amongst adolescent girls too. So that broke my heart. And, um, but it also showed me how important it is that we do this work and that we acknowledge that these one size fits all approaches will not work. It just won't, you know? Um, so when things are impacting, like I'll say it again, when things impact adolescents from acro across genders, it will most likely impact black youth even worse because of this added layer of racism and then for black girls sexism as well too. One of the things that we did within our Dreaming Girls project and um, the Youth Advisory Board is we develop a policy report, which isn't ready yet. It's my fault that it's not that it's not that's not ready. It's done, but because I'm an academic, I'm so meticulous. So I'm just noticing little things here and there. But it will be released, and I'll let you all know once it's released and in, in like a week or two. But one of the themes that came up through our advisory board was this need for society to protect, to, to, for girls to feel protected within their schools and for us to address mental health. Um, just a sneak peek, one of the main policies that girls wanted to see was mental health days. They wanted their schools to acknowledge that they are stressed, they are anxious, they are depressed, and they may or may not have access to counselors and rehabs and things that other um, girls and other communities may have. So for them, they felt like resting and um, engaging in mental health days would be great, you know, would be essential, not just taking a day off, but actually acknowledging that engaging in self-care of some sort may be, um, may, may be a benefit to they were also very aware that schools don't even talk about mental health. You know, schools are not even addressing um, mental health as well. So it oftentimes makes them feel like 
something's wrong with them. But, you know, so they want to be able to have more direct conversations with their teachers, with counselors, and actually address these issues in the classroom as well. So some of our next steps for the Dreamer Girls Project is we are creating the intervention. I'm working with an intervention consultant, so it's happening. We're going we're to um, pilot it, hopefully at the end of the semester. So I'm excited about that. Um, we are working with our youth advisory board to make sure the intervention speaks to black girls. So I'm super, super happy. Um, we're going to be adapting. I could talk a little bit more about that in Q&A, but we're adapting um, some commonly um, used interventions to create our own. Um, we're revamping the intervention, though, um, to focus on wellness and sexual health. In addition to drug use, drug use will be a main component, but also changing the terminology a little bit. Um, because like I mentioned, this intervention was focusing on drug use and HIV prevention, but girls felt like there was so much more they needed to learn about aside HIV. You know, girls talked about wanting to learn about their menstrual cycle, wanting to learn about pregnancy and what that looks like, you know, and um, how their bodies are changing, you know, and while this was not my intention, when I went into the study, I want to be tr stay true to the girls that trust us, to, you know, to create something for them. So that's why I'm, you know, working on this and also reframing it to really provide these young girls with the tools that they need, the you know programs programs that they need, and then also creating an outreach division for the Dreamer Girls Project um, as a researcher, but also as a social worker and somebody who is super passionate about creating a better place for, you know, for Black girls. I think it would be disingenuous for me to talk about empowerment and, and adult ally support and not actually provide any support um, to, black, to Black girls that I, I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so just to give you an example of some of the outreach work that I've done um, within my lab, um, is I started a Black, black Girls Go to Yale initiative at Yale where um, last summer, we invited a group of black girls from urban communities. Um, East Orange was one of them. Second one was uh, Patterson, where I invited them not only to Yale to do a tour, but also to meet to visit my lab too. Um, the main purpose of this was not only for girls to see themselves at Yale, but then also to understand what are public health researchers doing? Um, how does a lab look like? Granted, my lab is not exciting. Is this computers? Is this, is this computers? <laughs> But they were just happy to, one of the, the, a lot of the quotes that the girls came up with was they were just happy to see someone like me and my lab, you know, like seeing a black woman who comes from an environment like them at a place like Yale. Um, some of these girls that came on the tour, this was their first time ever going to a college tour. So it was so meaningful to them. And it also kind of helped to shape the trajectory of where they see themselves applying. And while girls said that, you know, they don't know if they're gonna get into Yale, et cetera, they just, just the fact that they were on campus was you know it was enough for them to change and it also made their other friends jealous so that was, <laughs> that's my goal make them jealous <laughs> and then also um i'm gonna share a story of bobby um she's another young girl that um i supported and i don't know if anyone has heard of the story it made national ascension but just to give you you heard of it okay <laughs> so um young bobby nine year old i'll go i'll go the story briefly nine year old girl from new jersey um was catching lantern flies you guys know where lantern flies are because I think New Jersey and New York have this invasion of lantern flies and they're like dangerous to trees and all this stuff. Connecticut, we didn't really experience it, but I know it was, in, it was really heavy in New Jersey and some parts of New York. So she found a formula online to, um, to spray the trees. Um, and there was this initiative in New Jersey where they were encouraging um, residents when they see a lantern fly to stomp it out, to kill it, to do all the stuff. So she, so she, this nine-year-old girl, wanted to do it in a much safer way that was um, safe for the environment. So she put together some mixture, apple cider vinegar or something, and was, was spraying her, um, her, her tree on her street. She wanted to save her street. And her neighbor, older white man, called the police on her, saw her doing this and called the police and said, there's a black woman in my neighborhood. I don't know who she is. She's scaring me. I don't know what she's doing. So the police came. I obviously saw I was a little girl. I mean, she's, you know, she looks like a little girl. They obviously saw I was a little girl. And, you know, they, you know, he, the police, thankfully, you know, they were very nice. They were very nice to the young girl and her parent and her mom about it. And um, when the police officer told the neighbor, oh, she's just spraying, you know, she's just catching lantern flies. The neighbor was like weirdo, right? And I only know this, thankfully, because of the, the body cam footage, right? So there was body cam footage to show how, when the police officer went to the little girl, how scared she was, but then also the reaction of the neighbor. So while the neighbor said that he apologized, I want to emphasize the type of trauma that this young girl is, you know, faced at that time 
where she was just doing something to save her environment and the police were called on her, right? Um, and the trauma that not only she faced, but her mom faced too. Um, and just, you know, one of the things the mom said was that the, the young girl literally wrote her mom a letter saying, mommy, yeah, I really want to go outside by myself and spray the lantern. I'm going to save the trees or whatever. And her mom reluctantly said, okay, fine. You know, you know your neighborhood really well. Go, go, go spray the, the, the trees and look at what happened, right? So this is just an example of just how Black children just can't be children in America. They're constantly being seen as a threat to society just by survive, just by living. So I, I saw the story on Twitter. So I saw the, the story on, on Twitter, the mom went to city council to tell, you know, what happened and demand for a public apology from the neighbor and the younger sister who's 13 also said the same thing. And I saw the story and I said, you know what? I'm gonna invite this girl to Yale. I want to use this as an opportunity to, to, to create a different experience for her, to, to create this positive memory for her, but then also to celebrate her as a hero. I could never do that. I'm terrified of the lantern flies. I could never, right? I could never do that, you know? So I was like, this girl is brilliant. We need to celebrate her. So this was back in November. I invited her to my lab. We did a tour of um, all the different labs at Yale, and grant, you know, we and granted, when I re re reached out to the mom, she was so excited. We were able to plan something within the next couple of days, and I reached out to some people at Yale who I knew ran insect labs and, and so, <laughs> insect labs and stuff. I was like, I was like, anybody running an insect lab? But I wanted to make it clear, it wasn't just looking for people that ran these labs. I wanted it to be people that looked like her. I wanted her to see that you can be a black female scientist. You can, you know, survive in this world and thrive and we're gonna celebrate you. We're gonna put our arms around you. We're gonna celebrate you because you are a star too. So I made an effort to find black researchers, um, students, some scientists who are willing to let her in the lab and kind of show her different ways um, to be a scientist. And then we ended the tour at Yale Peabody Museum and um, where the head collections manager allowed her to see, um, the insects, like they have an insect collection. Grant, this was, I've never seen as many insects before. So I'm not an insect person. So I always tell the family, like, I just did this for y'all because I'm not into all this. I'm not into all this at all. But it was then where, you know, they, they heard this, I told them the story, they heard it. They were so touched that they said, if you continue to catch lantern flies, you can donate them to Yale. And I told Bobby, I said, if you donate them to Yale, we're gonna have a party for you. I'll have the party for you. I didn't know how I was gonna do it. I just said it. I didn't know, I didn't know how I was gonna do it. I said, we're going to do that. So she was so excited. Um, she went, couldn't wait to get home and start catching lantern flies again. And then she mailed them to, to Yale. And we had a party for her in January, of her, like a ceremony for her in January, where we invited her family, invited her friends, um, invited some faculty at Yale um, and Yale Peabody to kind of just honor the fact that she donated these lantern flies and are now at Yale. Yale, I, I have to say this to everybody, Yale doesn't do they only did this, this for me. They don't do this stuff like at all. So they, they want me to encourage people, to let people know not to send them lantern flies. <laughs> you will not get the doctor of power experience. You will, you will not. But, you know, I, br I bring this up to say that this right here is an example of when you celebrate a child's strengths, right? It was a simple act that I was able to do just based on just my, you know, my love for, you know, children, but for, you know, for black girls, my duty as a Yale professor who does his work just from my home, from my home state. So it just, the timing of it was, you know, was perfect. And I couldn't have predicted the national global attention she has gotten, you know, just from, you know, doing this work too. You know, I, in addition to the family and other people that we worked together, we were able to change the trajectory of this young girl, you know, from that day where she had the cops called on her and she was terrified to do anything in her community again. Now she's a superstar. She's getting celebrated by the governor. Like she was, she, like she's doing, you know, doing great work. So to end my, my talk, I'm gonna bring you all back to Sheila. You remember, I remember Sheila, my girl, Sheila. Um, to remind you of her, um, Sheila was my former client who was struggling with not only identity issues, but with substance use, um, mental health issues. She was also highly motivated, unmotivated to finish high school. And um, when I worked with her, she was, um, she was like an alternative high school or something. I forgot what they, what they call it. I think it's called alternative high school, um, but was struggling to go to class. She just didn't have any dreams of being successful because of all these challenges. But then after working with her, 
um, you know, there were some success stories, you know, that we that we got. And before I went back to do my PhD, I connected her with other mentors. I didn't want her to leave her hanging. Connected her with other mentors, with a big sister and other people to support her. So she ended up graduating high school, you know, a, a, a year or two after we worked together. Um, she is currently in college. I get updates from her every year. She says me updates. So she actually, I need to update the slide. She actually graduated college. So she's actually graduated graduated college. Um, she was working full time. Um, she had an early dismissal from probation. So she was sentenced, I believe, to five years probation. She got an early dismissal because she was doing such, you know, such good, performing so well, um, and wasn't getting in trouble. And she is now a volunteer youth advocate for a substance use prevention initiative. All right. So she's doing, you know, she's doing great. So I, I want to end with this, that in my work with Black girls, empowerment, understanding their identity and so forth, I want to emphasize that I don't want to make it seem like Black girls need to be saved or, 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 rescue, or rescued. I don't want to come in as like a savior, like a savior complex. What, I, what they need is this knowledge of their power. They all have power um, and, this, and, this, and this ability to access you know, their power. And this comes from us as adult allies who can provide them with the necessary support, the resources that they need to just nurture their black girl magic and all of that that's within them, it's within them all. I wanna shout out my team, Courtney. Courtney's in the always, Courtney's, Courtney here. Hey, Courtney, Courtney. <laughs> Courtney was a research assistant in my lab. She's now here um, at Columbia. I'm upset that she didn't come to Yale, but it's okay. It's okay. I'm <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> but Courtney and Sydney, Sydney is a, is a research assistant at Yale. Um, they both co-led our youth advisory board. Um, I also want to, you know, shout out my postdoc, Satara, who helped with data, with, will help with the data analysis for our survey. And then Betty, too, and our, and our team who helped with the qualitative data analysis. You know, I am nothing without my team. So I wanted to make sure that I ended, you know, with, with them as well. And I want to also, you know, thank you to Columbia, to Odie, is that what it's called? Odie? So I want to, I want to. <laughs> Okay, okay. I wanna I wanna thank the Office of Equity, D of Diversity and Inclusion. <laughs> Odie, I'm sorry I didn't put your logo on my on my slides, but I want to thank them for having this series and inviting me to give this talk to you all. I want to acknowledge my institution. I'm grateful for the support that they've given me and not just my research, but my outreach work too. Um, you know, and one of the things that I'm most proud of is the work that I'm able to do directly with girls. Um, and that's just something also too I'm gonna leave with you all. Your research is great. I think research is important and informs the field. It changes the narrative, but we also have to think about how our research is impacting people on a day-to-day basis. Um, it's the reason why I do this work. If I can't work directly with, with youth and see the beauty of them, but also see how my work can change their trajectory, then I feel like I'm not doing my job well. So I just wanted to just highlight that and the support that I've gotten from the institution. And lastly, just wanna thank all the black teen girls who trust me who trust my team to tell their stories. And I hope that I make them proud and I hope that I'm able to continue to do great work to, to elevate them and to support them. Thank you all, that's it. Thank you.